right, good morning everyone. We're going to be in Romans chapter 1, verses 13 through 15 this morning. Let me pray for our time together, and we'll dive right into the Word. Father, I thank you for your Word. I thank you for the living Word, Jesus Christ, that you have sent him to die in our place, to give us new life, to make us into a people who are eager to live for you. Father, would you continue to bring that work about in us through our study this morning? We love you, and it's in Christ, and we pray. Amen. All right, Romans 1, 13 through 15. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So if you remember a few verses ago, starting here in verse 10, Paul says, Always in my prayers that he is asking that somehow by God's will I may now at at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. So he is Asking that by God's will, he may come to them. And his coming is fueled by a longing. In fact, you could even really say his asking is also fueled by the longing. He's asking that by God's will, he could come because he longs to see them. And we looked at the reason why he longs to see them, what he longs to do to impart some spiritual gift to strengthen them. He wants to build up their faith. He wants there to be a mutual building of each other's faith, and that is fueling his desire to want to go to them so that that can take place. So at this point, one might naturally ask the question, Paul, if you long to go see them so much, why have you not done so? If that longing is really there, why haven't you acted upon it? So now this is what kind of leads to the next few verses here. He tells them that he doesn't want them to be unaware that he is often intended to come to them, but he's been prevented. So if he wasn't prevented, the intention to come has been there. And the fact that he's been prevented also implies that he has taken some sort of steps to make that a reality. Maybe he intentionally started heading in that direction, but then the Lord changed his course or something came up that distracted him. Or maybe just in his mind, he has started to plan to go to see them, but then his plans had to change for another reason. We see this happen to Paul a lot. We've even seen it in the letters so far that we've been studying. And so now we see it here in Romans. He intended to go to them, but he was prevented. We're going to elaborate this a little bit more towards the end of the letter in Romans 15. We're going to get some extra insight, and Paul will explain why he was prevented. It's a little bit different than with the Thessalonian church where Satan had hindered. Paul doesn't say that here. He just says he was prevented. But in either situation, it was and is God's will for that to happen. So why is it God's will for that to happen to Paul? We'll see towards the end of Romans. But to continue in our study here, he doesn't want them to be unaware that he's intended to come. Why doesn't he want them to be unaware? Because it may affect how they view him or how they view his love for them. He wants them to know that he is genuinely concerned for their well-being, and he genuinely loves them. Why has he intended often to come to them? After this little side note, he continues, I've often intended in order that I may reap some harvest among you. This is why he's intended to come. Some interpret this to say that this is why he was prevented also, that God prevented him from coming in order that he may reap some harvest among you as well. 
I think that if the Lord prevented Paul from coming, it's for a reason and a purpose, and it's not outside the realm of possibility that this would be the purpose for that. But the way that the ESV translates this here, they place these parentheses there. The parentheses were not there in the original language. But I think that their way of blocking this off makes a lot of sense. I think that it's good and right to say that Paul intended to come to them so that he may reap a harvest among them as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. Why do I think it's good to interpret it this way? Well, let's continue here. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So he says that he intended to come in order that he may reap and further explains that he is under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians. Barbarians here would be non-Greeks. So just as we have a Jew and Gentile distinction, you've got Jews and then you've got everyone who's not a Jew. That's a Gentile. And so the Jews had a high view of themselves compared to the rest of the nations. We've kind of got the same thing going on here, where we've got under that umbrella Gentiles, we've got Greeks, and then we've got non-Greeks here. That's barbarians. And then we see that repeated with this next phrase, both to the wise, that would be how the Greeks view themselves, and to the foolish, that would be how the Greeks view non-Greeks. So Paul says he's under obligation. So because he's under obligation, he is eager. He's eager to preach the gospel to the Romans. So I want to give you another passage that will help to flesh this out a little bit more. 1 Corinthians 9, 16 through 17. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. So Paul, right before this, is talking about being paid for preaching the gospel. And he is able to boast among the Corinthians because he did not accept payment from them in his coming to preach the gospel. He says that as his status as an apostle, he could have done this, but he intentionally did not do it. And there are some who have slipped in among the Corinthians, and they're preaching a gospel that's distorted. And Paul is trying to lay out some basics to them and dissuade them from listening to these super apostles or false apostles, these other people who are having an influence. And one of his defenses is that they are coming in for gain sometimes, but Paul is not. He's not preaching the gospel for gain. He's preaching the gospel for necessity. Necessity is laid upon me. This phrase here I love. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. May this be the heartbeat and the cry of every Christian. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. I'm doomed if I don't preach the gospel. God, have mercy on me if I don't preach the gospel. I must preach the gospel, even if it means death. Well, what causes us to be able to say something like that? For Paul, we see that he had necessity laid upon him. That leads to this phrase here. And then in verse 17, he says, If I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. So Paul wants to preach the gospel of his own will, not of his own will. He does this because he views this as a stewardship. I've talked with several believers who reach a point 
in their spiritual disciplines where we have something similar that happens. There's times where it is their will, it is their desire to spend effort and time in their spiritual disciplines, the reading of God's Word, memorization of Scripture, prayer and fasting. They do that of their own will. Then there's times when that desire is not there. And their response to that is, I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to do something just because I'm supposed to do it. I want to do it because I love to do it. And because that describes their will in that moment, the way that they respond is by not engaging. Because I don't desire to do it, I don't want to do it, lest I be a hypocrite. I love that that argument is blown to pieces here in this passage. Paul is ready to preach of his own will and when it's not of his own will. When he doesn't have that personal desire inside of himself, why does he still do it? Because he is still entrusted with a stewardship. It's the same thing with our disciplines, with these other areas. Even those moments when we don't feel like it, we do it because we have an obligation. We feel a necessity. I feel like it is necessary for me to study God's Word so that even when I don't feel like studying, I study anyway out of necessity. That is not a bad thing in the sight of the Lord. It is good and right for us to desire that, so we should seek the desire, but when the desire is not there, we should not seek disobedience. A lack of desire is no excuse for a lack of obedience. So, Romans 1, 13 through 15. Paul's intended to come to them, but he's been prevented. And his intention is grounded in this. He wants to reap a harvest among them. He wants to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome. Why does he do that? Why is he so eager? Why does he have this longing? Because he views himself as being under obligation. I must do this. So Paul, as we continue reading through the book of Romans, we've already seen this theme of preaching the gospel here. He's eager to preach the gospel to them. Paul, before he actually makes it to the Romans, he obviously writes this letter to them. And in this letter, he is going to do just this. He is going to preach the gospel. I'm eager to jump into that with you, but I want you to see here that Paul's intentions, his obligations, those things that he knows he needs and ought to do, he has a desire for it. He's eager. He has a longing. So much so that he doesn't want to wait till he gets to the Romans to preach the gospel. He finds a way to do it now. And he's going to do this in this letter. May we have an eagerness and a longing to preach the gospel to others. May we view it as our necessity, as an obligation, so that when we want to do it, we are rewarded. But even when we don't want to do it, we do it because we have been entrusted with a stewardship. May we allow that eagerness to guide us to do what we've been called to do, even in ways that we may not have intended. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Father, we ask that you would stir up our affections to preach the gospel, to reap a harvest among those who have heard the gospel, to be mutually encouraged by one another's faith. Father, we want to be obedient to you whenever we have a strong desire to do so, And we also want to be obedient to you when that desire is not there. So, Father, we pray two things. Number one, that you would not take that desire from us, but that you would magnify it within us, that longing and that eagerness and desire. But then number two, Father, whenever that is not there, I pray that you would give us an extra measure of grace, giving us boldness to proclaim your word, 
because we have been entrusted with it. Father, we love you. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.